uh, a big thank you to BIC for involving me in its uh, International Women's Day celebration. I believe this is the last event. And a special thank you to everyone who has gathered here from uh, different parts of Bangalore. Um, it cannot be easy uh, to attend a program so late uh, on a weekday. So uh, I really appreciate your being here. Um, the topic that we are going to be discussing today is uh, making rights real. And um, this is something that has special significance to all of us at any time, but especially today because uh, this is International Women's Day. And why do we celebrate International Women's Day this month on 8th March? There are a few milestones which uh, preceded this. We do know that we went through a very violent time, especially during World War II, where human rights were violated uh, across the globe. This ended with a feeling that there must be some steps taken to bring about world peace. And there was a signing of the UN Charter in 1945, after which we see a more formal version of women's rights which slowly came in. But interestingly, if we are to look at how this particular day evolved, it predated the UN. And um, it predated the UN system. It came from the labor movement with women asking for better working conditions, including humane working hours and better pay. It was celebrated in different countries on different dates, right from 1911. On 8th March 1917, some Russian women who were celebrating Women's Day marched for bread and peace a march which contributed to modern Russian history as we know it, a provisional government, better rights for women, including the right to vote. This landmark event led to the recognition of March 8th as International Women's Day, and this was standardized. So uh, when we look at the UN Charter, we see that when the Charter was signed, it was signed by about 160 people, out of which only four were women. And even at that time, they felt that they needed to bring in women along with men into the charter. The charter, as we know in its preamble, talks about faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women, and of nations large and small. So although, as I mentioned, out of the 160 people, only four were women, two of them proposed to add women to the founding documents, and women later used this. So when the Inter Universal Declaration of Human Rights was drafted, and we know that 10th December is celebrated as Human Rights Day worldwide, they also insisted that gender-friendly language be used. So instead of just men, there were words like women used, and phrases like men are brothers were dropped. The Subcommission on the Status of Women, which became the commission later, um, had a couple of major principles that I'd like to draw your attention to. One is to raise the status of women to equality with men and to eliminate all discrimination against women in the provisions of statutory law, in legal maxims or rules, or in the interpretation of customary law. So when we look at rights, even early on, before there were formal international documents or instruments dealing with women, there was a feeling that women need to be treated better and that laws play a very important role in this. Much later, in 1976, the UN Decade for Women uh, was announced, and during this time, we had the CEDAW, which was adopted in 1979, which is short for the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Now, I will spend some time talking about the CEDAW,
because when we talk about International Women's Day, it's really important to look at some of these international standards that do exist for women. Article 2 of the CEDA is really important. It's the first article which discusses laws and it has a few legs to stand on. It talks about adopting laws for women's rights, that is new laws to be brought in, repealing laws which are against women's rights, so removing some laws, and also to take all appropriate measures to eliminate discrimination by any person, organization, or enterprise. So this moves beyond law to other measures that should be used to make these rights real. And it does not talk only about a citizen and a state, which was the language used in other human rights documents, but it says any person, organization, or enterprise. This is quite wide-ranging. Uh, article 5 is an important article which essentially deals with two things, with non-stereotyping, and with family education and the burden of care that women generally face and how it should be shared by both men and women. This is unusual because it is the first time that we find in an international instrument that you're not just talking about the state should do this or the state should do that, but also that society has a role to play in making rights real for women. The third article that I'd like to focus on is an, and we see that Article 16 talks about granting women equal rights within the family, which is often called also the private sphere of women. Now, Article 16 briefly talks about equality in family matters for women on par with men. This is especially relevant for our country, and we will uh, delve a little bit into this as we go along. Yet another article talks about uh, special measures where it allows for temporary special measures to be taken for women to bring about de facto or real equality along with men and also talks about maternity uh, and special provisions for maternity as a permanent measure which could be taken up. It is of course surprising to think at that time that maternity should be considered special but this was uh, several years ago. Now, what is India's stand on the CEDAW? So as we know, every country is sovereign, and when they sign an international instrument, they can choose. They can pick and choose and say, these provisions don't apply to us, or these provisions apply to us, but, you know, subject to certain exceptions. So India's position on the CEDAW is this, and I have put in bold the important part with regard to Article 5, which is non-stereotyping, it says, the government of the Republic of India declares that it shall abide by and ensure these provisions in conformity with its policy of non-interference in the personal affairs of any community without its initiative and consent. So, both for Article 5, which is non-stereotyping, and Article 6, which is family law, we see that the government of India has what we call declarations, which means that though we may give effect to other provisions of CEDAW, including Article 2, which talks about making laws, we are not completely bound to ensure non-stereotyping and um, you know, equal rights within the family. Now, the second part we can understand comes from a history that we've had, a cultural history of our country. But the first part of non-stereotyping is a little difficult uh, to understand. The Constitution of India itself, when it came about, had some very important provisions. It talks about equality before the law, and it talks about prohibition of discrimination on grounds of, uh, on many grounds, including sex. We see now that courts have interpreted sex as also including uh, sexual orientation or gender, and a lot of strides are being made in this regard. So we see that while changes were happening in the international dimension, they were also happening in our constitution. So there is not that much of a difference between the rights that may be there in many international documents and in our constitution. But in the case of CEDAW, 
read without declarations and reservations, these rights are much wider than what uh, we see in our constitution. In addition to this, today we need to keep in mind several intersectionalities. We understand that when we talk about gender equality, whether it is in the public sphere or in the private sphere, that all women are not similarly placed. And these intersectionalities, first talked about in detail by Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, are very important. This leads to intersections where there might be what earlier used to be called a double discrimination. So while we understand that women's rights are important to all women, there might be women who face uh, discrimination in ways um, that need to be separately studied and understood and protected in law. So these include caste, class, gender, by which I mean uh, trans women and everyone from the LGBTQI community, disability, among others. I've just taken these four as examples that I might use as we go ahead. Now, what do we mean by the public-private divide? Initially, when we looked at human rights, we see how the UDHR was drafted. We understand that the state was the biggest violator of human rights. So we had to discuss situations where there is uh, a relationship between the state and an individual which ought to be monitored and protected. However, when we talk about human rights with regard to gender or with regard to women, we see that women's human rights are largely violated, not directly by the state, but by a private individual, usually within the home. Now, this is not to say that state power and individual power are the same and that these two situations must be treated in the same way. But unless we understand and recognize the fact that most women face rights violations in the private sphere, a human rights framework which focuses only on the public sphere is not going to get us anywhere. We also see that in many international instruments that came about, the conventions, for instance, on uh, civil and political rights, or the International Con uh, Covenant on the Economic, Social and Cultural Right, all put the family as a basic unit and the family is often privileged. We see that also happening in law. A special status given to the family often means that people within the family become invisible, that power dynamics within the family are unknown or not properly understood. It also means that vulnerable people within such families, whether it is a woman or children or elderly, do get adversely affected. The question that we have to ask ourselves today is where do we locate women's agency and rights within this private sphere, within the sphere that she is actually most at risk of rights violations? What is the duty of the state to take care of a woman in the home? Now, this has never been an easy question to answer. It is difficult because unlike other public uh, spheres, this is something that has been protected by politics and by culture. So how do we reach women in these private spheres and how do we protect their rights? I could go on for hours on the different rights that women have in this private sphere and how they could be protected. But I thought I would focus on um, two different kinds of rights that we could talk about. Um, one is reproductive and sexual rights, and the other is rights in fam what we call family law. So reproductive and sexual rights are you know, a whole bunch of rights that women do have and women should have. The first right that, of course, comes to people's mind is that of abortion or medical termination of pregnancy. But that's not really the beginning. It goes much before that. You have access to your bodily integrity as a human being. A woman has 
the right to decide whether she wants to get married, whom she wants to get married to, if she wants to have sexual intercourse within marriage or out of marriage, the right to make an informed choice on a relationship she might have, on her sexuality, on whether to have a child or not to have a child, on the contraceptive choices that might be available to her. She also has the right to determine the number and spacing of her children. Now, how have all these rights been impacted by uh, society and the state? We see that over a period of time, when we consider these rights, and if you just Google, you know, something like love marriages in India, or abortion in India, you will get a number of views, usually not from women who have been forced into marriages uh, or from women who have tried to access abortions. But everyone has something to say on what a woman's right should be on these areas. And, you know, you'll get all kinds of answers. And it is really disturbing because if you are to consider the woman as a rights-bearing individual, and you consider her as having bodily autonomy, which is a right under our constitution, and as protected in international law, she should have the right to choose. Often we hear the slogan, my body, my right. And that is not you know, an empty slogan. It means that these are choices which are to be given to women and that nobody else has a right to say how she should exercise that choice. Nevertheless, when we look at the law that actually exists and the working of the law, we see that this has not really happened. Uh, in law, we see that women's choices have been quite um, clearly controlled for long periods of time. Women's choices to what kind of contraception are often determined by state policies on what to push. And we know that at a time when um, you know, vasectomies were common, they were being conducted because they were easy, from the time that you could do a um, keyhole tubectomy, suddenly tubectomies became more common. Instead of promoting contraceptives that women could use and control, reliance was placed on contraceptives which required government intervention or uh, medical intervention. We see that, therefore, there was no real right to make an informed choice for most women. When we look at medical termination of pregnancy, we see that the law was so completely controlling. In the initial days, even when we had a law and the law was brought about, the law was really um, very moralistic. You know, who can claim, and among the many grounds that existed, you also had a ground that was only available to married women, that is a failure of contraception. So an unmarried women in those days who used contraception and where it failed would not be able to use, uh, would not be able to access abortion services. Now, the right to determine number and spacing of children is also a very important right that women have. But from the time she gets married, we live in a society with high son preference, and we see that there is a lot of pressure on women to uh, produce sons. Small families coupled with a very successful family planning uh, initiative from the government led to the idea that a small family is a happy family. But what is the happiest than having a son and one extra spare son? So we see that due to you know, the government policies, there was a push towards um, you know, sex-selective abortions. We see a shift in the sex ratio because of uh, you know, partly driven uh, by the family planning policy. We also see that this entire idea of reproductive rights or sexual rights is only understood uh, you know, with regard to women in reproductive ages. So what happens to women beyond that? What happens to women who are middle-aged, those who have difficulties, who may need a hysterectomy? These are groups uh, that, you know, the health sector does not really consider very interesting because they are not in the childbearing age. So we see that as far as reproductive and sexual rights are concerned, there are uh, two difficulties. One is, of course, the difficulty that the law itself is not perfect in so many ways. But the second difficulty is that even when you do have a right, how do you make this right real? 
even assuming that a woman has access to abortion services, I mean, she can access legally, where are these services? Even assuming that a woman knows that there are these different kinds of contraceptives available, where are these contraceptives? So somehow there is this disconnect between what the law says with regard to women and how they are actually able to access these services. And this is true for women's rights as a whole. I remember as a much younger and idealistic uh, person when I started working on women's rights about 25 years ago, you know, I always thought, okay, things will be better. You talk about the law and, you know, you have to change the law. But then we, you know, uh, get to know that unless that is really implemented at the ground level, unless there is a change coming from the ground, from all the sectors, you know, you can't wave a magic wand, create a law and expect rights to fall in place. So there is a big gap sometimes between women's rights that do exist and the reality in the private sphere. The other area which is definitely more problematic and more diverse is um, okay, uh, the area of family laws. We all know that we live in a country with plural legal systems where um, family laws are concerned. We have a diversity in family laws. Part of this diversity is already uh, woven into the constitutional structure. So the constitution we know has uh, in the seventh schedule three lists. Most of us have studied that in civics, a union list, a state list, and a concurrent list. Family laws fall into the concurrent list. So both the union as well as the state can make family laws. We also know that the constitution has protected some states and their family laws. For instance, some of the states in the Northeast, which can protect their own customary laws. Unfortunately, a lot of discussion on legal pluralism has revolved around religion. It has revolved around uh, personal laws on the basis of religion. But this is much more diverse than religion. Personal laws may vary based on caste. It may vary based on tribal identity. It may vary based on geography. It may also vary based on sex and custom. I can give you a small example because I don't have uh, much time. Uh, if you look at Christians, which are a very small community in India, you find concentrations of Christians, maybe in Kerala, in Goa, in uh, three of the north northeastern states, which are Christian majority states. And in all these places, we see that, you know, Christian laws varied a lot. In Kerala, until the state's reorganization, when the state of Kerala was formed on November 1st, we see that uh, Syrian Christians in Kerala had very different succession laws. In Goa, which was under the Portuguese, not under the British like much of the rest of India, they, would, they had very different laws. And uh, they had laws which today we may understand in some senses as uh, uniform, but they're not completely so. If you look at the Northeast, for instance, Christians in the Northeast had very different laws. Mizos, our tribes, they had their own Miso law, which were patrilineal laws, which varied slightly from tribe to tribe. In Meghalaya, Khasis were matrilineal, so property went from the mother to the youngest daughter. So even in a small group like Christians, you find that the diversity that is there in personal laws or family law is really very wide. So when you're talking about situating rights in the personal sphere, in the private realm, the challenge is much deeper than that of the public spaces. These are laws that we are dealing with within communities, which may be good, friendly to women, which may not be friendly to women, but which are in their own ways extremely uh, diverse. We also see that they would vary across sex, for instance. The most commonly known are Muslim law, for instance. And when you talk to any group of people and you ask them, can you tell us how law varies on the basis of sex? They will say, Muslim law varies on the basis of sex. Muslim men and Muslim women have different rights. But that is also true 
of Hindu men and Hindu women. You have different laws of succession for Hindu women and different laws of succession for Hindu men. So how do we make rights real in family laws? Most times when we talk about family law in the context of International Women's Day, the common answers that come up are, you know, that you should have a uniform civil code. Now we've seen in the case of Goa, and we've seen in other places across the world, that a uniform law may not necessarily be a gender sensitive law. And how does a uniform law take into account the diversity that is naturally there in our society? So when we are looking at making rights real in family laws, what do we mean? How do we ensure that these rights actually become real for women? In 2018, the Law Commission of India did consider this question. And they uh, pointed out a few things which I think are very good to keep in mind today as we discuss this issue. One is that there is diversity in family laws and that the diversity is not necessarily a bad thing. With this diversity, we also need to keep in mind constitutional standards and try to bring in constitutional standards into these diverse personal laws. That would be a good way to go. Uh, it would be an organic way to go. It would make small steps, but it would move towards uh, better rights for women within different communities. The other thing they also said was to make rights more inclusive. Now, early on in the case of the National Legal Services Authority, which dealt with rights of transgenders. The court in Obaita, by the way, just said that laws need to change in order to take into account rights of LGBTQIA communities. And, you know, nothing has happened after that. Laws have been set in a gender binary of male and female. Changes that have come up in laws over time have still been set in a gender binary. There might be tokenism done. For instance, you might have a gender neutral washroom, or you might have a gender neutral form while filling out your uh, passport application. But by and large, when you're looking at concrete rights and the way that uh, the state organizes people's lives through law, we see that this has not really been incorporated. And it's high time that this was really uh, brought in. So to make rights real in the family space, we need to do three things. One is one, acknowledge the diversity that exists in these spaces, a lot of the diversity which is constitutionally protected. Two, make sure that constitutional standards and international human rights standards come into these laws so they bring in better rights for women. And three, look at these rights being more inclusive, not just on the basis of sexuality, also on the basis of caste, on tribe, on disability, and on so many other uh, intersectionalities. Um, there was a debate some years ago between two feminists by Susan Okin, who wrote a piece on is multiculturalism bad for women. It was a very thought-provoking piece and very daringly named. And the piece sort of tried to understand whether multiculturalism by itself was something which was bad for women's rights as a whole. And whether rights of minority women could be properly protected in uh, in any given situation. So she looked at a lot of examples where she's, she pointed out that you know, rights of minority women may not be uh, well protected. There was a response to her given some years back by another feminist called uh, Letty Volp, who looked at this issue and wrote a response to her, which is called Feminism versus Multiculturalism, saying that these are not two opposites. They should go together. And she pointed out how that in uh, othering the minority, that you're taking for granted that majority women's rights are protected. 
that they do not face rights violations. And some areas we know, like uh, domestic violence, cut across these uh, you know, different groups. About one third of women face domestic violence in whatever group they are in. It does not matter whether they belong to the majority group or to the minority group. So this is not a good exercise. This is a pointless exercise. What instead we really need to look at is whether every woman in every group is adequately protected both by the law and by the resources which should go into fulfilling what the law requires. This year, in 2024, I just looked at the UN theme for International Women's Day. And the theme is uh, a relevant one for our times, keeping in mind the poverty that exists in our world today, the impact of climate change, which women uh, face so keenly, and the many difficulties and rights violations that women faced, which have still not gone away. The theme is invest in women, accelerate progress. So what does this investment mean? For me, coming from the field of law, of course, the first answer I would give is that we need to invest more in changing laws, changing rules. Not just at the macro level, but also at the micro level. Not just you know, keeping in mind a majority group of women, but also to keep in mind different intersectionalities. And this is really important because otherwise we will be doing groups of women a lot of harm. Let me give you a few examples. Um, our center at the law school had done a study on women with disabilities and sexual and reproductive rights. And one of the most common responses that we received from women was that whenever we go to the doctor, what they tell us is that whatever problem you have must be linked to your disability. So they do not see us as women beyond our disability. And the rights that women could otherwise exercise, like going to a health center on their own, accessing contraception on their own, making some choices on their own, are not really applicable to them. We also see that in a society where you have limited resources in families, and these resources are um, you know, overwhelmingly used by uh, the men in the family, where women get only some of the resources, women with disabilities get even less. And they're expected to be thankful that the family is uh, taking care of them. So what does the legal framework look like for this woman of disability? living in a place with few resources. How does the law reach out to her? How is she able to actually access her rights within her family? These are questions that we should be asking ourselves. We may not be able to find answers overnight to many of these problems, but there you have it. These are problems that are worth thinking about and rights that we need to get. Lastly, let me uh, talk for a few minutes about uh, the difficulties with the law as we have it today. Feminists have often said that law is made by men for men, very often. And as the saying goes, you know, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us to temporarily beat him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. So what are the what are the tools that we can use to have better laws, to have better uh, programs, and to accelerate progress by investing in women? These are tools that we must borrow from the language of the CEDAW. We need to make laws that are specifically for women, for which we need more women legislators. We need to address the difficulties that women face in the private sphere. We need to be able to deal with stereotyping of women right from our textbooks where you show the woman, the mother cooking in the kitchen and the father going out to office. We need to remove stereotypes that are associated with the marriage of a girl, with her going to her husband's house, with the fact that the daughter-in-law belongs to the family and that she has to adjust. 
we have to deal with stereotypes of the worthlessness of women who are single, uh, stereotypes which deal with women who are older and who do not deserve the same kind of care, women who are widows and who are uh, considered to be um, you know, a blot on their family and not included in family uh, festivities, and women with mental disabilities. We need to look at our systems, whether they are criminal law systems or family law systems, and see how women who belong to different castes experience marriage or relationships that are not marriage. Are we protecting rights in relationships that go beyond a Brahminical marriage? This is what it means for a woman of caste when you're talking about uh, the private sphere. Finally, I would like to end with saying that, you know, things are not hopeless. Every year that the International Women's Day comes along, it fills us with hope that we will use the standards that women have fought for, that generations before me and generations after me will fight for, for better rights for women. And that at some point of time, both in the public sphere, as well as in the private sphere, which continues to be invisible so largely, that finally we will make rights real. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. <clears throat> We've just heard a very um, broad, uh, wide-ranging presentation by Dr. Sarsu on uh, how women's rights ought to be extended by the legal system, by the framing of laws and by the setting up of uh, mechanisms to protect women's rights. Uh, but I'd like to start today by just asking you to say a little bit more about CEDA and about the ways in which they extend, CEDA extends the meaning of <coughs> law and, uh, uh, you know, even how it mm, takes, uh, uh, takes a framework of understanding what law really means in people's lives, how it's different and made it more rich and meaningful for women. Because uh, the founding, one of the founding principles of CEDA in the way in which, of course, state obligation everybody understands. But um, substant the concept of substantive equality, I think, is uh, the specific uh, advance that CEDAW made in, in terms of uh, how one understands the meaning of equality and how the law can provide for that. Could you say that, uh, say a little more about that? Um, <clears throat> sorry, I think both of us have bad, bad throats, so please uh, bear with us. Um, certainly, I think one of the important features of CEDO is that it moves from a framework of uh, nominal equality uh, or paper equality, which many of the uh, earlier conventions dealt with, to looking at what is called real or substantive equality, seeing that when we talk about equality, we mean that it must be equality that women actually experience. So, CEDAW actually talks about making these rights real. And how, how do we measure this real equality? So it's not, for instance, enough to say that we have the same objective standard. Here is a job. Both men and women can do the job. And, uh, you know, women are not barred from uh, taking up that particular job. That would be formal equality. But if you're talking about substantive equality, it would look at why do many women post-pregnancy drop out of jobs? Why does the pay gap between men and women increase when there is pregnancy? And the reason for that is not just that, you know, biological women do get pregnant and they get maternity leave during that time, but that the burden of childcare falls upon her, that she is unable to go back to the workforce, that some groups of employers may be reluctant to hire a, a woman who might take maternity leave. So how do you uh, make sure, how do you bring about laws which um, make it costless uh, to become pregnant or make, make it costless to raise children? 
how do you remove stereotypes uh, which ensure that you know if a woman changes a thousand diapers you take it as something that she has to do but if a man changes a diaper it will be all over facebook and twitter and people will be saying how wonderful he is as a dad so i think that kind of a real equality is what cedo talks about and it reinforces that when it talks about uh, special measures to say that states can take special measures to ensure that uh, women actually receive equality so uh, i think you know in the private sphere that is what we are looking at do we see for instance i can give you one example where in ancestral property now technically hindu men and women have equal rights to ancestral property in family law but if we look at uh, the ground realities we see that you know daughters who get the property often give it away to uh, their brothers um, because they feel that they don't have the right and they want to keep the peace uh, in the family so how do we make sure that we challenge this how do we make sure that women are actually able uh, to uh, get the rights that the law uh, gives them is definitely something that concerns um cedo and that it speaks about uh, substantive equality <clears throat> now we know that uh, one of the important ways in which uh, cedo has been used in various countries um, is to where there has not been a national law for the women uh, cedo has been utilized to provide the framework in which the legal framework in which Uh, a law is framed to favor or to make life better for women and in india itself we know the uh, very um, important case of the prevention of sexual harassment law which was basically uh, drafted to after a very distressing uh, incident where a woman who was on a government program uh, bhavri devi working with women's rights Mm, was uh, she just did her job what she, as she was told uh, reported a child marriage and she faced the most horrible consequences of being gang raped in her own on her in the presence of her husband by the families of the ch- baby who was a 9 month old baby and so that whole episode which ended very badly for women's rights because the rajasthan high court uh, said that it's it's a it's a false case she could not have been raped because she's an untouchable plus there was an uncle and a nephew involved allegedly involved in the rape and that was not feasible that in the culture this does not happen intergenerational uh, you know uh, rape violations don't happen this is the way it, the uh, the judgment played out so it everyone sort of uh, sat back in shock became immobilized i would say because we were all part of that whole process but vishaka one one ngo went to the supreme court and asked for guidelines to be published which would make working uh, yeah, women who work make it easier for women who work so that they don't get sexually harassed at the workplace so that situation was redeemed by the passing of the now the sexual harassment act prevention of sexual harassment act bill now um, the importance of that is that it was used cedo it was used because though they were adequate pro- provisions in the law in the indian law cedo was used to extend the meaning of, for instance to bring about substantive equality which perhaps is not exactly a prominent part of the indian law uh, you know the way it's applied and uh, so would you like to comment a little bit about that of course um I mean it is true that in Vishakha and in many cases dealing with other laws like um, Gita Hariharan which dealt with equality for a guardianship for instance also CEDA was used but um, and in many other cases which dealt with uh, equal rights of women but it's never been used alone as a standard that we rely on and I think there we need to make an important distinction so where CEDA has been used in uh, these cases it has been used along with constitutional standards so there is no case which has uh, relied on cedo standards alone without also using constitutional standards which has led uh, legal experts to say that maybe the arguments under cedo are persuasive arguments you know but they may not um, 
be used uh, directly. I think this is also the uh, because um, when we look at uh, India, India's India is what we call um, a dualist country where when you sign an international instrument, unless it is passed by the legislature, it does not become automatically the law of the land. Unlike other countries which might be monist, which can directly uh, use the CEDAW. So yes, the CEDAW has been used. And interestingly, uh, now that you have mentioned this case, when we look at uh, the reports that India has given uh, to committees, it has always talked about implementing CEDAW through the passing of the Domestic Violence Act or the Posh Act. You know, so it sort of uh, tries to say that, look, we are co in compliance with CEDAW, even though it may not be, you know, completely uh, binding on us. So yes, it does play an important uh, role, I think, for sure. Uh, but then there's also this uh, interesting, uh, rather painful situation where we have a law which is about uh, 100 years old, the Prevention of Child Marriage Act, 1924, if I'm not wrong. So we are at the centenary of that year, of that passing of that law during the British period. But child marriage continues to be practically the norm in the country. And uh, we know that one of the important rights, uh, which uh, reproductive rights which uh, and health rights which are violated are that of girls when they are married off as children. And uh, so what would you say is the reason why uh, child marriage has continued to persist as a practice, as a social practice, despite it being outlawed. Of course, we also know about other laws related to women, the Domestic Violence Act, the way it is applied. The fact that 498A has not been ideally you know, implemented, the fact that child marriage is not um, punished the way it ought to have been. Uh, you know, the, so why is there this gap between, uh, how, is it true to say therefore that uh, the law, legislation is far ahead of social change? How do you think, should we wait for society to change? Because I've heard you say many times that the law is what is practiced on the ground. Many, you have said this more, on more than one occasion. And I, while I do agree with you, isn't it also important for us to uh, understand how we can advance women's rights uh, by progressive legislations and the application and the making of rules, uh, which will actually uh, translate that into reality, into the it, into making women's rights real. Uh, I'm not going to say thank you, Cynthia, because this is child marriage is literally a minefield of different issues uh, together. But I will try and navigate this uh, as carefully as I can. Um, I think, first of all, you know, when we talk about child marriage, we also uh, need to talk about child sexuality. Children can also be sexual beings. And, um, you know, the Convention on Rights of the Child, for instance, um, um, I'm not getting the exact uh, phrase now, but it does talk about, um, you know, uh, the the competence of a child which you know grows over a period of time and that we have to uh, keep in mind the fact that you know as a child matures to adulthood you know you can't treat a two-year-old child and a 17 year old girl the same way uh, the other thing I'd like to point out is that child marriage is not something which is only prevalent in India or only even prevalent in what are seen as developing countries you do have um, you know, laws dealing with child marriage in, in other countries as well. And if you look at the United States, for instance, 50 different states uh, have different laws dealing with uh, child marriage, some of whom do recognize uh, child marriage under certain circumstances. So, I mean, I'm not advocating child marriage, but what I'm saying is that we also need to take into account the reality of our society. Even in Karnataka, there is a substantial number of girls, maybe um, one quarter, if I'm not mistaken, though I might be mistaken, um, of girls who get married below the age of 18. But, um, you know, when we look at the child marriages which do get the attention of the state, uh, we have to see that there is a clear difference between two different kinds of child marriages. In the one case where the child is exercising agency, does not want to marry whom the parents have chosen or wants to run away with 
you know, a boyfriend or get married on her own. Those are cases where the parents contact the state and the might of the state falls heavily on the child. So the child is apprehended, the young man is accused under POXO and under, uh, for kidnapping, uh, for uh, so many other offenses. And we find that, you know, there, uh, these are reported cases. These are often what are referred to as romantic cases by child marriage uh, activists. The other set of cases where parents, in fact, get the child married, nobody talks about. That doesn't even uh, come into the public um, eye. You know, uh, here the child is forced into a marriage, and that's a forced marriage as compared to, you know, uh, a consensual marriage for the child. And in these forced marriages, hardly anyone is actually punished. So I think the question of child marriage is a very uh, nuanced one. I do understand under CEDAW that, you know, though we have a declaration on that, that there is an obligation to make child marriages void. And um, uh, this is really not the way that we should go as a country, though interestingly in Karnataka, child marriages are void. Because making a marriage void means that it is not a marriage in family law. And this affects the child as she grows into adulthood. That a void marriage uh, is void always. So even after 30 years, 40 years, her husband can turn around and say that this was not a valid marriage, it's a void marriage. You have no rights as my wife. It affects the validity, her position as a wife, her right to get rights uh, in family law, like the right to maintenance, and the legitimacy of the children. So I think these are areas, I think at least child marriage as an area is one that we must uh, tread carefully because otherwise, um, you know, law can do more harm than good. Interesting that you mentioned this uh, question of being a, a child marriage being void. <clears throat> I just want to share my experience. In the year 2007, uh, after a long gap, India was uh, uh, participating in the CEDAW committee and I was part of the uh, NGO group which went there. And one of the big uh, things we lobbied about, the women NGOs lobbied about was child marriage. There were three actually. One was the Darith women, the violence against the Darith women. Uh, women being uh, uh, burnt as witches, being tortured and killed as witches, witch hunting we call it. And then the other was uh, child marriage. So these were the major themes that we were lobbying around. And, uh, and I was assigned uh, uh, child marriage. So I really worked hard running around to all the committee members and giving them slips on, on this sort of thing and saying that they should uh, insist on registration. Of course, uh, you know, the government has a convenient uh, way of saying we cannot register because if you, if you register a marriage, then they have to prove the age of the child. So that's a kind of a preventive or a deterrent. That's what we thought. But we, f we were very uh, annoyed, upset that the government decided to take a stance there that no, 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 we are, uh, uh, it is actually banned, uh, there's prevention, uh, there's prohibition in place, but in terms of registration, we won't be able to do it because of various uh, administrative problems and so on. But when we came back, if you check the record, the following year, in the year 2008, they passed a law which made the child marriage voidable at the choice of the girl. The girl can go, when she becomes 18 and say, she might have been married over the age of 10 or whatever, but when she comes to 18, she can say, I do not wish to acknowledge this marriage and I want to uh, ask for it to be made void and the government would do that. So this choice of making the uh, marriage voidable was uh, preferred by the government as a way to go around the child marriage thing and also about uh, acknowledging whether, because they also were saying the legitimacy of the child born in the relationship is important and all that. I, I, I don't agree with that at all because a baby is born and has legitimacy whether or not the parents were married, whether the parents, I mean the child is a citizen of the country. So it is, it's, uh, it's, there is no question of whether a child is illegitimate or not, that doesn't uh, follow. I know the law won't agree with that in, in, in practice. But therefore, we should, we should um, not make that concomitant to the nature of the marriage, is my feeling. But at least it was something, it's, it's something rather than nothing. 
to have the girl get an opportunity to at least say word. And apparently, many girls have indeed utilized that, particularly in states of Rajasthan, where very, very small infants are married off. And there's a big push uh, by NGOs on getting girls married, making them stay in the system till the age of 18. If you, if you know, that is one of the strategies to prevent child marriage officially. Keeping girls, making them study till the age of 18 is one of the ways in which, so that is why the education department is involved. Since I have also worked with the Mahila Samakya Karnataka, we have done this work of saying, make sure the girl stays in school till she's 18. If there's any undue absenteeism, please go. The children, the teachers, whoever, neighbors, whatever, they're all asked, even the boys in the, in the, in the class are said, just monitor and see whether there's any engagement being carried out. Why is this girl not coming to school? So the community becomes a part of the process of keeping the girl in school till she gets 18. Hopefully after that, getting her married is not an issue. So some of the ways in which society and the government's policy makers have also tried to create a climate for girls to study more and simultaneously pre uh, prevent uh, girl-child marriage. In our country, as you know, in South Asia, overall, there is there are uh, girls uh, tend to have uh, lower age uh, marriage at uh, age at marriage is much much lower in uh, many South Asian countries, especially in India. And in parts of India, it's very very stark. And so that can only be a good thing. And uh, I'd like to know if you'd like to say anything about how we can. I remember when I one of the things I did as part of the my involvement with CEDAW processes was that I wrote a detailed research paper on CEDAW and Dalit women. How does CEDAW apply or not apply or had not been adequately applied to the situation of Dalit women? Because one of the worst uh, things that happen is the high level of violence, especially sexual violence, that Dalit women have faced in the country and impunity for the crimes against Dalit women. So how do you think we can use this idea of uh, uh, substantive equality, non-discrimination, and state obligation in this for this vulnerable section. How do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, just to maybe I'd start off from the child marriage and then uh, come down to the question that you specifically asked. Um, you know, for child marriage, it's exactly what you said. You know, sometimes the solution does not lie in rights, but it lies in ways that you can make the rights real. So when you have better education, you have job opportunities, children are in school and they know they have a future that they can work towards, you automatically see uh, child marriages coming down. You know, it's like the population policies, as we say, the development is the best contraceptive, you know. So uh, a lot, um, and we saw in times when there was extreme vulnerability, like during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, child marriages actually went up. Uh, because people lost jobs and they found themselves economically vulnerable. So I think there is a close relationship with, uh, you know, uh, prosperity in a society and opportunities that are available to a girl and uh, child marriage. I think uh, to some extent when we are looking at making rights real, that is also true uh, for Dalit women. And as I mentioned, caste is one of the very important intersectionalities uh, in India that we realize that women don't get opportunities and Dalit women even less uh, opportunities, both in terms of education and jobs security. and security. Uh, and, and of course, these are, this is you know, not new. It is a cultural phenomenon. We see that there is a discrimination which can happen both in the public sphere, despite all the laws on that, and also in the private sphere. And certainly there are a number of uh, studies that have been done, for instance, looking at uh, convictions, for instance, in cases that involve, uh, you know, Dalit survivors and how, um, you know, our courts decide. Uh, so I definitely think it's a very important um, intersectionality in India, which we have not um, explored thoroughly, you know, so where CEDO is concerned, certainly, uh, in many of the reports, they have spoken about minority women and Dalit women. And unlike women, um, unlike uh, many women who face 
primarily violence from the private sphere, that is women face both, both from the public sphere as well as the private sphere. When you look at uh, state actors too, Dalit women are more vulnerable to violence than non-Dalit women. So certainly it is something that must be, uh, you know, must be considered very clearly. And though we do have constitutional safeguards and laws on it, there is, um, you know, when we consider how it's working on the ground, Dalit women's rights are not becoming real. And certainly it's an uphill uh, struggle and there is... Uh, definitely uh, a lot to be done. But in my view, I think that is probably the largest intersection uh, in India where gender is concerned and the one that gets uh, quite often ignored. Uh, thank you so much for, for that uh, uh, very comprehensive answer. Uh, I think now we're coming to uh, a time where we can uh, ask for questions. Uh, if there's anyone who'd like to ask questions, uh, depending on the question, we will either take it alone or we'll take two or three at a time. So any questions, we can... Yeah. So, very, <clears throat> very beautiful presentation from both of you. I've really, really learned a lot. Thank you so much. My question is, see, in spite of having all these laws, it hurts me when I keep reading that women are misusing the laws, those kind of, you know, label on them, even by the higher judiciary, whether it is 498A or whether it is sexual harassment at workplace. And the law itself, sexual harassment at workplace especially, it says that women, uh, what women uh, who misuse the law can be punished. Now this one uh, particular section where I can't find this kind of section, wherein you are saying that if you use this law, we are going to punish you. Maybe it is, the condition is different. I understand that one has to prove that she's misusing it. But nevertheless, this kind of attack on women's rights, first of all, it is about sexual issues where women hardly talk about. And in, in law like this, if you incorporate this kind of sections, women will hesitate more to use it. So I would like to know why is it that we have CEDA, we have a constitution, in spite of that, we have this kind of, uh, you know, trying to uh, pull them back from exercising or using, accessing these laws, whether it is 498A or sexual harassment at workplace laws. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, you know, usually it comes framed the other way around, that, you know, women are misusing the laws and what do you think about it? At any gathering that you speak about women's rights, <laughs> Certainly when, um, you know, there is a push against patriarchy, you must expect some kind of pushback. And I think this entire rhetoric of women misusing the law is part of that pushback. But, you know, um, my response is always, what are the statistics? It's very clear, for instance, where domestic violence is concerned, at least one third of women, you know, even by a conservative estimate, face domestic violence. Do one third of the women complain? So women are not even using the law, forget misusing the law. And that's also true of posh cases, especially because it involves sexual harassment. Uh, women at workplaces are even now in the society that we live in, very particular that, you know, uh, either they don't complain or, you know, that the complaint mustn't go outside. Their own families should not know of the harassment. And very often, um, you know, they are... Uh, more open to a compromise, to saying that let him stop harassing me or let him give a private apology without taking it to a full-blown complaint. And as someone who's worked on, um, you know, IC uh, internal committees, this is something that I have seen um, happening. Is, uh, it, and it is, of course, because uh, people would point fingers at her. So I think that is a response really to give people who are saying that the law is being misused, that it is not even being used uh, in the first place. And statistics do show that it is not being uh, misused at all. So, um, you know, so I think that is, uh, and everyone will have this one anecdotal story. Oh, I know of this person to whom that happened. And I don't think we should go with that. The data shows otherwise. Uh, I'd just like to add to what she just said. The other important hard fought right for women we got was 498A. And this frequent charge, including by judges sitting on the in, on their bench, saying that 
you know, this is not so important. And, you know, even the public prosecutors, somehow they seem to deprecate 498A. But we know that 498A is a very important provision. But on the other hand, women may or may not know about it, but I do know of lawyers who have in many cases inappropriately uh, filed complaints under that, which, which is why this whole claim that women are misusing the law is placed at the door of women. I don't think women know that much to be, most women don't know that much to know how to ab abuse the law. It's their lawyers who tend to, you know, pad up their case with this provision and therefore, uh, you know, we have things like elderly in-laws being bunged into jail, sisters-in-law being bunged into jail and that has created a lot of negative publicity for, uh, for 498A. So in many ways how we apply it is also important and not just use it, use it like a blunderbuss. So it's a, it's a very nuanced uh, provision and needs to be uh, used properly. And the DV Act also has been um, um, innovation because uh, otherwise earlier there was no non-criminalized uh, law for women in domestic violence. The husband had to be uh, treated like a criminal. So the DV Act was an adjustment that the women's movement made to say that uh, a civil so a solution may be brought about for a family issue. So th there have been some kind of attempts to innovate, no doubt, uh, but not enough and not, uh, it's the, 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 the entire, the work has not been appreciated and used in the rightful manner. That would also be a part of the problem. Yeah, someone else put up their hand, I think. Yeah. Uh, I want to do what are the uh, key aspects that actually change society in the direction of gender equality. Uh, what we hear a lot is that it's education, but what we see is that education is not enough or uh, even among educated people, they women don't really have enough uh, um, understanding of their own, uh, I don't know, uh, rights. And not just legal rights, but also they don't feel entitled to equal treatment. Uh, so is is education uh, part of the solution or is it the main solution? Is it employment? Is giving fi women financial freedom enough? Or is it um, uh, in terms of government policy, what are the main things? Uh, and uh, that's one question. And also, is there anything that is being done to tack what, what actually tackles misogyny, which is the which I think is the root of all of these things, uh, but uh, what what in terms of government policy is being done or can be done, which will actually affect this uh, the root problem basically. <coughs> uh, well, on education, first of all, you have to look at you know what is the purpose of education. So most education today is so that people get a job and earn money. You know, it really has nothing to do with changing people. And so it leads to odd situations. Like for instance, um, a little earlier I talked about, um, you know, the, uh, about sex selective abortions. So if you look at sex selective abortions in India, where did it really start? And who are these people who are seeking sex selective abortions? So if you look at Karnataka, you know, sex selective abortions were very high in Bangalore urban, where you have many educated women. So the women were educated, they were working, they wanted a good lifestyle, they wanted small families. So sometimes they were also making this decision to have smaller families and to only have maybe one son. So, um, and if, but if you look at the sex ratio, let us say in tribal areas or in Dalit areas, they were better sex ratios because one, they did not have this, you know, this kind of an education or even access to uh, the technology. So education will not help unless it is dismantling patriarchy. And most education is in the patriarchal uh, mold, which is why when we are talking about education being necessary, we are talking from uh, a perspective of, you know, the privileged few who have received some kind of education through which we are able to earn. But I think when we are educating uh, children, I'm not an, uh, I don't educate younger children, so, uh, forgive me for making these broad generalizations. We need to make this education for change. We need to tackle patriarchy. 
One example that I took is, you know, how we see gender roles, but also how uh, we talk about uh, difficult things to children. Uh, and, you know, how we uh, show them that it is all right to make a choice. Um, you know, so it should not just be, uh, I'm not just talking about sexuality education, I'm also talking about education that breaks down patriarchy. And unless we do that, we're just going to have the same people. As I said, you can't use the master's tools to break down the master's house. So you can't expect these children who are uh, being churned out, you know, in a patriarchal mold to suddenly grow up and change and change the system. Okay, so we need to start uh, off uh, very early. I think I will leave the second uh, question to Cynthia. <clears throat> I think the, uh, I'll, I'll also touch upon education as such. Uh, I think it's important what kind of education we're talking about. We're not talk only talking about a professional education or just a higher education. Here we need to think about how we make better uh, citizens. I think in a, in a sense there has been an important uh, attempt at transforming society through the mode of the constitution of India. You were right when you said about misogyny being a part of the social framework. And in a real sense, the constitutional values which talk about non-discrimination on any basis is one of the biggest counters one can think of uh, for uh, a social transformation. And if we can train our younger generations in understanding these values better, I am very, in one sense, one of the good things that happened with all the uh, civil unrest that took place a few years ago uh, with uh, relation to the CAA and protests and the NPR protests, was that everyone started reading the, cons the preamble to the constitution at every street corner. Because this was, everyone finally woke up to realize that they had something which was important but had been disregarded as a means for social change and to protect each other's equality and citizenship. So that is the real uh, way in which we can educate ourselves. And for that, you don't need to be through a formal school. You can even talk to people who are adults and who have not been through a formal schooling about rights and about how it's good to have equality in society. And that is what will ultimately, the, the, what, um, uh, what CEDAW talks about, that is state obligation substantive e equality and non-discrimination are also very much enshrined in the values of the Constitution of India which talk about equality, fraternity, you know, liberty. So these are the ways in which we can reinforce, uh, you know, our own value systems and also uh, grow in our understanding of how we can use uh, the law, the framework of the law to transform society. Any other questions? Yeah, several hands. Three hands come up. Uh, I really like the shift that the previous question brought about in the discussion. We moved from an external perspective from society and its structure to the internal perspective. Especially with gender, do you not think that the internal perspective is more important? I. I might be speaking a little brashly here, but I, as a man in a patriarchal society, am, am, am exposed to so much symbol, symbolism in my life that just makes me think that um, despite a woman having a concrete treat, the concrete sense of duty does not build in me. So especially with gender, as opposed to caste, class, or uh, disability, gender has a lot more internal aspects. So, I like that question. Uh, how do we create a sense of duty amongst those who ex are exercising power or abusing it or whatever? So how, how do we shift the discussion to the internal aspects? That's my question. Like, how do we tell our kids stories that really make, how do we, like, I see a movie. It's, it's just sad to see the portrayal, how we depict gender and gender roles. So. Uh, how do we change culture, is my question, essentially. <laughs> That's like the billion dollar question. So, um, you know, culture is something that changes over a period of time. You know, you see it in yourselves. The language that you use is not the language that your grandparents use. The food that you eat, 
may be slightly different from what you know your grandparents ate and law is also very much part of culture so culture is dynamic it is never static it changes you know it's it's not always going to change in a good way it can also go uh, you know uh, the other way but changing um, culture at a macro level is you know it's easier said than done it takes a long time but if you're talking about individuals wanting to change there are plenty of materials out there there are you know books there are good books there are good movies um, there are good uh, you know shows uh, that you know you uh, can expose yourself and your friends to uh, in order to change but you know i don't think for children that really becomes a very individual choice because uh, the first learning that is there which is why a lot of the international in, uh, instruments also say the family is uh, the basic unit of society is what they learn in families so at least when they step out from the time that they are in schools the state i think has a duty under the constitution to break down some of this to challenge what the child has learned in the family gender is of course a big part of it but there are also other intersectionalities there is caste for instance which also the child picks up on uh, what food is good and bad you know uh, for instance what is okay to eat and what is not okay to eat on religion on so many other aspects so in a state uh, that is bound by uh, and we live in a constitutional democracy democracy but it's not the people of india but the constitution of india that is supreme and uh, as cynthia said you know the preamble is uh, key and the state cannot uh, abdicate its responsibility of trying to make this change this is exactly the non stereotyping that the cedo also talks about something which is very relevant every single women's day that we celebrate i have a simple question all of you must have heard about the I mean, are aware of the power of movies in a, in every culture how many of you saw rrr i want the hands up rrr how many uh, I, i see one or two hands only three i just started to listen to it decided you're not going to see it okay how many of you saw lapata ladies so you see they they are like two polar opposites in a sense you know the the, the film uh, rrr and the film La, lapata ladies are almost like polar opposites and has a very strong uh, women oriented theme the lavata ladies has a very strong uh, women oriented very realistic not preachy and a very humorous take on what everyday people experience in their lives and so that's how also you can influence culture by promoting you no know, more and more people need to see this but i dare say it won't be a blockbuster hit but it will be in the long term uh, uh, some material that can have potential to make people look at uh, their own lives their own cultures uh, in a more um, uh, in a more perceptive manner it makes you more aware about how things are happening in the society so there's one girl who's uh, willingly going to her husband's house very happily and she's lost and there's another girl who's rebelling but uh, has made a compromise but suddenly get an opportunity to break out of that op- uh, thing and how she uses it and then how the the whole resolution takes place an amazing story very very simple and very realistic and grounded so we can make a difference by promoting such telling such stories by becoming part of a, a, a becoming part of a um, project uh, that makes transformative change through telling stories that everyone can do so i suppose that uh, i think that's one of the most powerful things we can do we always talk about people's lives and and that's why i use a lot of storytelling in whenever i whenever i speak <clears throat> i get the opportunity to work a lot travel a lot experience uh, people's lives in different ways because of my work and i never hesitate without like except keeping their privacy of the people's concerned but you can always use these stories to make people think differently about a problem that's what i would say thank you any uh, other yeah Uh, firstly thank you so much for sharing your insights i had a question uh, regarding how we can make the uptake of certain policies that exist better for women because if you look at the posh policy we see that women are often hesitant to report a case and then if you take a different policy like for, or for example if you take 
how child marriage can be avoidable, I imagine that the challenges would be even higher for a woman or a girl from a rural area to actually take that option, right? So what can we do as a society to actually give women the confidence to come up and report cases or to uh, report the marriage as voidable? Yeah, I think that is, I mean, what you have talked about is really the gap between the law and its implementation, you know, how do people actually implement the law. And <clears throat> no, it, it, is, it, is, it is not an easy an answer. So sometimes the law itself changes to make it more user friendly, uh, as Cynthia pointed out, you know, when we uh, ask the woman question in domestic violence, what do most women want? They don't want their husband to go to jail. They don't want to divorce. They just want the violence to stop. But it took so long for the Domestic Violence Act to come up, to give us remedies just like that, like a stop violence order. So one, of course, the law can change to make it more accessible to people who use it. But the other is uh, other side of it is that uh, you know we need to change systems in order to make it more accessible to people. And I think a typical example of that, and very obvious example, is that of disability law, right? So, if a person with uh, um, you know with um, mobility disability is not able to go and cast a vote. That means an entire group of people are not able to exercise their citizenship rights. So how do you ensure that they're able to cast their votes? So either you have to have them picked up and brought to the voting booth, or the voting booth should go to them. So there have to be solutions that have to be uh, thought about to deal with that particular intersectionality. So the intersectionality that you have mentioned are two. One are, um, you know, women in rural areas, and clearly we have a huge urban-rural divide. And with, when you look at resources, you know, when we when we look at newspapers, they're largely focused on urban problems, or potholes in roads, or no water in mul what big buildings, or something like that. So rural uh, issues do not get the same kind of attention, except during election time. And certainly, um, women who are um, you know, uh, who, and, and being in a rural area is also an intersectionality, is, you know, doubly discriminated in that sense. So certainly we need to uh, make rights more accessible uh, to people wherever they are. The second question you raised was about a woman not being able to complain in, in, in a workplace. And this could be because of two things. One is the workplace itself. And many places, and I'm sure this is the experience of those who've done post trainings, uh, when you go to the uh, place, they say, oh, we've never had a complaint. Now, I say that need not necessarily be a good thing. Because that does not mean you have never had sexual harassment. But pe uh, women don't feel comfortable complaining. Because one, they don't know if it will be confidential. Two, they don't know if the management will take any action. So, uh, it could be a possibility, uh, it could be possible that uh, the law is not working uh, from the employer's perspective. But could, it could also be that the woman is vulnerable. And we often ex, you know, tell women, fight for your rights, or expect a victim to fight for their rights. We expect victims to be resilient, and that's completely wrong. She's not in a position to fight for her rights. She's not in a position to be resilient. She needs help. And if we don't give her that help, then we are not making justice acceptable to, you know, accessible to her. And that is what Cynthia said, you know, then you're talking about nominal equality, you're not talking about real equality. So I think that accessibility to rights is as important towards making rights real as talking about the, uh, the legal provision that gives rights itself. Uh, I think it's important that so many of us have come this evening to be here and to uh, learn about how to make women's rights real. Now this place is an obligation of, on each of us, you know, that we also become um, part of the solution by sharing the information we have, by building awareness, by encouraging women and girls to access their rights, uh, by learning a bit more about the kind of... See, for instance, many people know that posh, act, posh committees exist. But most posh committees will be set up by managements in corporates or government institutions which already know what the rules are. They already have service rules. But then where does a, say for instance, there's a street vendor who's been harassed by the police. She's at a workplace, her 
The street is her workplace. That man who's harassed her, who's a policeman, is in his uniform. It's a place for him also to, to work. So where does this woman go? Do we know? There is a provision in the Labour Department to file such a complaint. Online also you can file, but you can also file a written complaint in the Labour Department. In the Labour Department they have, they receive complaints like that. So this kind of information we need to share. The labor, you know the Labour, there is a Karmikara Bhavana in um, Dairy Circle. There is a place where they receive complaints. So these kind of things we can share, we can tell people. So there may be domestic, uh, you know, women, uh, domestic workers who face such harassment. And we can share that this is the kind of thing that they can do. They can uh, go to take help. So these are the ways in which we can empower, because uh, enabling women to access their rights, rights is a way of empowering them. That is what I have tried to do in my own work. So there's this lady who had, was being harassed by her husband. So he had, without her knowledge, she's a mother of three girls, without her knowledge, she, he had filed um, a divorce petition and had seen to it that three uh, summons had not reached her. So the fourth time he was going to get an ex parte divorce. We happened to come to know about it because the letter traveled all over the place and finally landed about a week before the final hearing. So then she came rushing to us and then we went around and caught her lawyer. Her lawyer hadn't find, filed vakalat. So we ensured that uh, we stood there and told the, told the uh, judge, sir, we did not get any summons. We are not aware of this. Please give us another chance. Here's our vakalat. We filed vakalat with our lawyer. And after that, she had to attend hearing. So I used to go with her first. Then after a time, I said, I wasn't able to go. So then I said, see, now you know the way, you know how these things work. You should go and you should do it. Don't expect me to come with you every time. After that, she went on her own. Not only that, she became helpful to other women who are in similar, similar situations. So what was uh, disempower could have been disempowering for her, ultimately became a means to, for her to empower others. So that is what we also can be. That's how we also can become part of a social change. Last questions, if there are any. Um, uh, at the outset, I would like to thank both of the speakers for the very insightful and exhaustive presentations. My question sort of draws on what has already been asked. So there are instances of internalized misogyny, internalized homophobia. We see that in several of like child marriages that are uh, ultimately like undertaken and cases of domestic violence we often see that women are encouraging or somehow participating in like those kind of acts probably because of social conditioning by virtue of their position in the patriarchal society in, in a country like india so how do you think law can be used as a tool to you know effectively or on ground like impact uh, and bring about change in these instances where women can actually learn that this is something that is wrong and that we should not participate in it by virtue of being in the position that they are. Um, I mean, I think the only way that women can know of their rights is by legal literacy. But we are in a country where we have so much illiteracy. You know, forget legal literacy, you know. So we are also very illiterate as uh, a group. So many Women are either not aware of their rights, uh, you know, they're not aware of the fact that um, they have like rights to property or they have the rights to, uh, you know, uh, choose someone that they can marry or whatever it is. But I think the real reason is not that they are unaware in many cases, but that they don't have the power to exercise agency uh, to do what they are doing. So in all this, we mustn't presume that the law is on the side of the women. It often is not. We've seen in um, you know, some cases of even honor killings where the law has taken a very uh, lackadaisical attitude, you know, where people have not been punished. Or we've seen in the recent spate of you know, so-called anti-conversion laws which seek to prevent um, women from marrying the men they choose to marry. Uh, we've even seen it in the case that is known as a Hadia case, where the woman had to go right up to the Supreme Court, uh, and where you know the courts further down actually said that oh, even if she's 22 years old, she needs to get her parents' permission to marry, which is which is ridiculous, which is not what the law says. 
So I think it is not really, uh, you know, always that the law is empowering and we have to be very careful about uh, the way that law is going now. The law is, in fact, changing in ways that adversely impact the rights of, um, you know, young young people to forget marry, even to uh, live together if we look at uh, the recent, you know, Uttarakhand Uniform Civil Code. Uh, so this, this is really problematic in itself. But even where the law is useful, we have to understand that at the ground level, there are many forces that uh, apply which go against this woman or the young couple, which compel her to uh, go home, where, uh, you know, the person that she is with might be apprehended if she chooses to run away, even if she's an adult woman. So I think, you know, we have not been able to really uh, move to a situation where we actually have what is called a rule of law, where the law is actually working in order to uh, protect uh, the people whose rights it claims to protect. And I think this is being done with impunity. And unless we are able to address that, you know, uh, we are really not going to uh, be able to see women exercising their rights in the private sphere uh, very easily. Uh, uh, hi. Um, actually, I think, um, Sarsu, I think just as a posh consultant, so there were a lot of questions on posh. Uh, I also happen to be a consultant in that space. I think two, three things which I, I may want to highlight with your permission is, um, uh, you know, I think the first point that you had made about the provision which says that if there is a malicious complaint under the posh act, uh, the complainant should be held equally responsible. You did allude to the fact that it was regressive. Um, I guess my experience having worked in this space for 10 years is, um, uh, you know, in law, to establish malicious intent is a very high level of, it requires a lot of uh, diligence, a lot of, uh, you know, one has to be sure that you're, you know, tagging the case as malicious uh, complaint. So, um, like I said, having worked in this space, my experience tells me that uh, it's a good balancing clause in the act. Because, you know, one is therefore kept away from allegations of, you know, from labels around misuse of the DV Act, misuse of the, you know, the dowdy harassment. So uh, I think I would like to counter you on that one to say that this is a nice provision in the law which says that, you know, don't use the law as a, as a tool to misuse your rights. So I think that's the first thing I wanted to state. There was also some comment about, uh, you know, What's the law? What's the law? Again, my little personal experience, I do have a son who's in college. I don't know how many of you have done it. My son has been buying my STs since he was seven years old. I mean, since his class seventh. Personally, the little I've seen, I think a lot of changes within our household. How many of us, I do know households where, um, you know, let's say when women are on their periods, something as simple as, uh, something as, simple as not allowing them to attend rituals, you know, let's say religious rituals. I personally think we probably need to do a little bit of interest, you know, a little bit of thinking around what is the change we are bringing about within our respective households. The little I've seen of college kids, I think those probably that have been brought up in households, you know, where there is no taboo around a lot of it, I think that they are very conscious about, so let's say, if I go to a college, a lot of them have girlfriends and they're very conscious that, oh, you know, mama, she's on, on her periods, so I got to provide her support. So I think one is to say, where's the law? The second is just a little bit of thinking about what are we, what kind of, of culture do we have within our families? I think that plays a very important role, you know, as we move along. And I think to your point on Posh and a lot of people that said, um, just so that people know, Posh allows even a third person who has, let's say, witnessed uh, somebody being harassed, Posh allows a third person also to file a complaint on behalf of the victim. So let's say, uh, so there was a certain case that I was involved in where, you know, the, uh, uh, a person from the housekeeping. Yeah, I'll just make it really quick. So she was being harassed, so you had someone who stepped in. So I think just, you know, to your point, in some spaces, we have the law. I think it's just about maybe implementing it and being aware of you know, what the rights are. So it's more a comment, not a question, but excellent presentations. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. OK, just to also uh, respond to Rashika, I completely um, you know, agree that you know, things can change. And there's this uh, very um, 
you know, satirical essay written by Gloria Steinem, and you all should read it if you can, which is called If Men Could Menstruate. And it says uh, that, you know, if men could menstruate, obviously, then, um, you know, it would become an enviable, boastworthy event. So right now we say that women cannot join the army because, of course, they menstruate. But it would say things like, you know, uh, you can't join the army. To, give, uh, to take blood, you have to give blood. So only if you menstruate, you can join the army. So everything that is uh, uh, associated with, you know, powerlessness because of menstruation would, um, you know, suddenly become uh, powerful. And, um, you know, so that is how uh, it said. So it said that, you know, some people would, uh, you know, say that, you know, women are unclean because they don't have the monthly cycles where they, you know, they cleanse themselves and things like that. So what the article hits at is that things that are seen as male uh, would be justified in a patriarchal society, even if it was something like menstruation, you know, if we let them do that. Uh, I think on that note, <laughs> we've reached the end of the session. Thank you, thank you so much for this fantastic, fantastic session, for this conversation. Uh, uh, thank you uh, to the audience. Thank you both of you for uh, being here with us and doing this. And like bulbs have gone off, eyes have been opened. And of course, it'll be up on YouTube. So please tell your friends uh, to access the conversation who weren't able to make it. Uh, look up our website for more such conversations, events. Everything we do is open and free to everybody. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you, both of you, for coming. Um, good night, everyone, and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.